Okay. So real quick, I want to do a coding session on functions. It should be fairly short. I'm going to go over three basic singular files and then one example of separate files. So let's just go ahead and hop on over, take a look. Okay. So let's see, where do I want to start? I know the third one. Let's see. I think we can just do this one first. Yeah, this one has like, a few examples I want to show off. So there's some comment out code and I'll explain why it's coming out in just a second. But let's go ahead and take a look at the uncommented code. So we have a function here and then we have our main function creating some arrays here. And then we're calling the actual function with some parameters. So the function itself is getting the length of an array and its parameters are a pointer the array and the array size itself that's not the length of the array that's what the function is for this is the total array size and bytes so similar to how we've done our size of array divided by size of a data type so what we're doing here is printing out this is a void function it's not returning anything we're just printing the actual array length so it is a long unsigned data type here and we're doing array size which is passing in the size of the array as the actual parameter here, and then size of array index zero. Now, you might notice that this is a pointer of an array for the actual parameter, and that's fine. If we do the index here, even though this is not technically an array, whenever you pass an array into a function, it decays to the pointer to the beginning of the array, you don't actually get the proper indexing, which is why I can't just do size of array, which we'll see in just a second. That's why this parameter exists at all. But even though it's not a proper array, we can still index it and it'll still jump in memory every single, in this case, it's an integer, so every single four bytes. So indexing will still work properly, but you won't have a good frame of reference to stop if you're doing the size up method to get the proper length of the array. So this is one way that we can actually create a length function doing that. Other way you'll see in a bit is instead of doing the actual size of the entire array is you just pass in the static length of the array as an integer, it's, that's fine too. But this one I wanted to do size of one to show why you can't do it as its own standalone function. It'd be very nice if you could, because it's generic, it's portable, but unfortunately due to the way of pointers being, not pointers, but arrays being passed into functions, since it decays to a basic pointer, unfortunately you don't get the size of function. It'll, it'll work and I'll explain what's gonna happen in just a second, but I digress. Okay, so we're just creating some arrays here in the main, not a big deal. We're doing length array one, which is this one up here. And then we're also passing in the size of that array. Same thing array two here with the size of array two, array three with the size of array three. That's all we're doing. We just want to print out the actual lengths of the function. So real quick, I'm going to do two lane. We're doing length right now. And I out and I get five, eight and 11. And if we look at it, 5, 8, and 11 are the actual sizes or the lengths of the array. That's the number of elements inside of them. Now, I'm going to comment out these, uncomment these, comment this, and uncomment this. This would be, in my opinion, the ideal way of doing a length function is just passing in the array and then just having a singular function getting the size of. However, again, notice that we're not getting the actual array passed into the function because we can't. We just have to have a pointer to the array, which is very unfortunate because this gives us the size of the pointer now, not the size of the entire array. Whenever I do this down here, this gives me the size of the array and I can pass in the total bytes of the array as its own parameter. Now, this is just giving me the size of the zero of the element, which will work regardless if it's a pointer or if it's an array, that's fine. So if we do this, 
it'll make the same thing. Um, yeah, you'll even notice that. That in my warning, it says size of R will return the size of the pointer, not the array itself. So even the warning in C line here is telling me, hey, this is this is gonna work, like this will function, this is gonna compile, but this is not gonna do what you're gonna think it's gonna do. So if we run it, then we just get two. Because that's the size of the pointer here, it's gonna be eight divided by the size of that, it's gonna be four, so we get two, basically. Pretty sure that's what's happening here. By digress. Essentially, this is the proper way of doing it. If I compile, there's no warning. And I actually do this, I get the 5, 8, 11. Not a big deal. If I wanted to do static, oh, actually, I think my next one, let me see if my next one does it proper. Okay, yeah, that's why I have, I have a different. I'm passing in the static links here. And since it's, since they're C arrays, they're gonna have, they're generally gonna have static links. So you pass in the actual finite value, that's okay. Not a big deal. So this is getting the average of a array. So very similar setup, three arrays, uh, three print statements that are printing out the results of a function call of average. It's a double function, so we're returning a singular double value named average. It's passing in, again, the pointer to the array, and then an integer for the number of elements in it. That would be that five, eight, and 11 that you see here. And we have a sum, initialized 0, 0.0, a loop to loop the number of elements, incrementing throughout every single one, and then we're just adding each element to the sum through the loop, counting the loop up as you go, and then eventually we just return the overall sum divided by the number of elements, giving us the actual average. So if I compile this, then you'll notice that we get our averages. I'm not going to go through the math here. If you want to do the math and check it out, I checked it earlier and it seemed fine. I think, well, I do the first one. So four, two, that's eight, no, that's six. No, okay, six plus another six is 12, plus an eight is 20, 23, Divide by five is going to be five goes into 24 times. Six goes into the 30 is going to be there. So yeah, yeah, for, for one six. And then you get to the math here. I'm, I'm not going to do the math right now, but essentially it's just a very, very simplistic average function. Okay. Next one is a little bit more of a convoluted one. You can already see that's a this this is a lot of nesting here. And then the actual main function is just as simple though. So again, let's just start with the main. Three integer arrays. Actually the they're not exactly the same, they're slightly different. I changed some of the values. And then three print statements. But we're doing frequent, so we're counting the most frequent. So we're seeing what element appears most common in the arrays. So integer this time, same parameters, just the array pointer, the number of elements. We have two integers here, which is the most frequent one, and then the actual highest count. So it's tracking whichever one of these has the highest count. So walking through these loops will be a little bit troublesome but it shouldn't be too bad so let's start so we have a for loop that is going through every single element in the array so it's just i is equal to zero i is less than none elements and increment i every single time for every single element we start another for loop and we start it j equals i so we start at the current Trying to think of the best way to kind of think about this. Maybe I'll do a comment here. I think kind of we have maybe four takes. Well, let's do this. Three, four, three, 
five, six. Okay, let's say that this is my ring. So initially, oops, I have I here. I just make this an actual comment. The I is here, right? This is that top of a loop right now. And then beyond that, I have J. So J is currently, J goes I, so we're just looking at three. And with the internal loop, we have a temporary counter for counting this three where I is. And it's going to count it up starting at zero every single time for every single new element. It's going to start at zero. For J is less than the number of elements, and then J plus plus. So, if array I equals array J, then we will increment the, the temporary counter. And if the temporary counter is greater than the highest count, back from up here, then we will update the most frequent to array I. And then the highest count will then equal the temp count, so updating it. And then final return. So let's see how this works a little bit. So is array i equal to array j? i and j are both three right now. So yeah, so temporary count's gonna go up, so that's one. And then most frequency gonna be updated, so now it is three. Highest count currently is one. J is now here. Is array i equal to array j? No, it's not, so we just skip it going is array i which is three equal to array j is they're both three right now yes it is the temporary count is going to increment one more time it's going to be temporary count is two now temp count is greater than highest count now so we update it's going to stay three but highest count will now equal two and then this will keep going to j does not equal six that's not equal then we're done with j and we exit out but then we need to update i to go to the next one and then whenever the actual loop starts j is equal to i so now we're at four number count is going to go to one because we found one give it uh, that's not equal that's not equal that's not equal so we end up with just not changing anything but then for the next one, I is here, J is here, and then rinse and repeat the whole cycle over and over again. But we already found the most frequent one is two threes here, so the most frequent is going to be three, and that's what we return from the function. So if we look at this, get rid of all this, save, then you'll see that we have four two eight three six we have six five nine one zero eleven five two so this one should give us five we can see that pretty easy and this one i think has two ninety sevens right i'm just gonna run this now and see what happens oh, frequent. yeah out four five nine seven so the thing that's happening here is the most frequent is being updated at four, but it's never going to be greater than the temporary count will never exceed highest count. They're all going to be one, so it just stays at four. If I wanted to update it to be the last one on the list, I can just change this greater than or equal to. Now all of a sudden we get six, which is the last element. If you want to do a proper accountability of multiple elements, so like you had two elements set up here three times each, you could incorporate an array to find all the unique elements and then just count them individually and then check the counted comparisons separately. But if you just want to find a very, very simple one element that appeared the most frequent, then this functionality would be pretty good. There's no technically easy way of finding the most common occurrence in terms of coding it yourself, but this is a way of doing it. It's a very, very simplistic way, has a lot of holes that you have to account for, 
but it does function. Okay, those are the individual files. Moving on, you see that we have a folder over here in the top left that has three files in it. So I'm going to CD over to it, like so. And if I do LS, next up. Then you'll notice that we have main.c, temp.c, and temp.h. Okay. So what we're doing is a temperature. Oh, oh, that's not what I want. I want this main file. Main file is super simple. It is very short. Basically, you can just only see like six main lines that we care about. Well, maybe seven, actually. Seven lines we care about. These three floats that are just some initialized data. It's Fahrenheit, Celsius, and Kelvin. And then we have three print statements that are two significant digit floats, Fahrenheit, Celsius, Kelvin, and then the actual printing of it. It starts with Fahrenheit, which when we have a Fahrenheit to Celsius for that Fahrenheit value, Fahrenheit to Kelvin for that Fahrenheit value, Celsius to Fahrenheit, Celsius to Kelvin, Kelvin to Fahrenheit, and then Kelvin to Celsius. The other line is this include temp.h. Yes, we're doing um, standard io.h, that's from the actual standard library, but from this temp.h with quotation marks, that is pulling this file over here, which you can see we have our macros, well, our preprocessor, to make sure that temp.h is only included once in the entire program. And then we have our function prototypes, which again, as I said, is Fahrenheit Celsius, Celsius to Fahrenheit, so on and so forth. Not a big deal. It's just initializing saying, hey, these are some functions that are gonna exist. We'll keep them around, and then they'll be included by the main.c. And then we have a final one over here. Oh, it didn't show up, my bad. Oh, it did show up, I just dragged the wrong one. Okay, and then we have this temp.c over here, which will also include temp.h just to pull in the prototypes so it knows that they're there. I'm going to put this over a little bit, and then I'm going to probably click drag this a little bit to get that. This over. I think that's, that's good enough. we have the actual bodies of the functions here. So Fahrenheit to Celsius is just doing the conversion, the good old Fahrenheit minus 32 times 5 ninths. Celsius is to be Celsius times uh, 9 fifths plus 32. Then finally we have the Kelvin one. Again, Kelvin is just, if we wanna go from Celsius to Kelvin, we add 273.15. When we go from Kelvin to Celsius, I do subtraction of 273.15. It's it's a pretty stationary difference between Celsius to Kelvin. The only difference is 273.15 in a particular direction. So that one's pretty easy. And then for Fahrenheit to Kelvin and Kelvin to Fahrenheit, I really just was lazy and I was like, I'm just gonna nest my functions because I already have some that converts Fahrenheit to Celsius, Celsius to Kelvin, so I can just nest those functions and it will do the math for me up here, no big deal, and then do the exact same thing for Kelvin to Fahrenheit. And so in order to do Kelvin to Fahrenheit, it just calls this function inside this function and operates just fine. So when I actually wanna compile this, I'm gonna do clang dot main dot C, so we're pulling in our main file, and then I want to add temp.c, whenever you compile multiple files, you're going to want to include all the .c files that you have. You will not include the .h files in this command. Those will be included by the preprocessor, so not a big deal. You just need to tell the compiler every single actual C file, because that doesn't get really touched by the preprocessor, generally speaking. So whenever I do that you can see I have my ADA out and then I have 76 degrees Fahrenheit equals 24.44 Celsius 
which is equal to 297.59 Kelvin, 64.4 Fahrenheit equals 18 degrees Celsius, which equals 291.15 degree Kelvin, then 85.73 Fahrenheit equals 29.85 Celsius, which is the same as 303 Kelvin. So, just some basic temperature conversions, not too bad, but a decent way of showing how to separate files out. But, all that being said, that's all I got for functions, really. It's not too bad. So, there we go. I put pedals and it was just, I couldn't find the actual pedal, but I digress. That's the majority I have for functions. I already touched on a lot in the previous video, which is my slides going over it, but I want to do a little bit of hands-on showing of some stuff, especially with the arrays and pointers and showing the difference between this might what you expect to happen, but it won't work, especially for that ceiling warning is that, hey, you're wanting the size of the array, but you're getting a size of a pointer instead. And that would be the natural way of thinking as you pass in an array to a function and nothing's gonna change, right? Unfortunately, yes, it does. It's the case of the pointer. So you have to be careful of that. And then also I kind of want to show compiling multiple files together and then showing how they all kind of relate to each other. So, well, that being said, that's all I got for this. I hope you learned something as usual and I'll see you in the next video.